Henry Ford II. In recent years, there has been a lot of talk about our highway situation. So much has been said that I feel sure a great many of you must have wondered, as I did, whether there was anything a private citizen could do about a problem so big. That's why we decided to study the situation. The results are published in this book. We call it Freedom of the American Road. Simply because we Americans always have liked plenty of elbow room, freedom to come and go as we please in this big country of ours. The first thing we found was that you can't talk about highways without talking about traffic and safe driving too. We found that there are many experienced highway and traffic safety experts who are doing a great service to the public. What they need is public understanding and support. But the most important thing we discovered was that already many private citizens in states and communities across the nation have gotten together to tackle their local problems with real success. We present a few of their stories in this motion picture. We do so with pride, for here, it seems to me, is real democracy in action. And now for a first-hand report, let's go to our Traffic Safety and Highway Improvement Department and our reporter, Westbrook Van Voorhees. Thank you, Mr. Ford. For our first story on what a community did about a dangerous local highway situation, we take you to fast-growing California, where highway problems have multiplied with the increase of population and of travel. This is San Francisco. See how it is located on the northernmost tip of a peninsula. Its only access from the north is the Golden Gate Bridge. From the east, the Bay Bridge. Now you are looking south from downtown San Francisco. Below you is Bayshore Highway, the traffic artery of the peninsula. City after city for 30 miles, flowing into each other in a continuous line out of San Francisco. Let's go back to June 1951, to the California Highway Police Station at Jefferson Avenue and Bayshore Highway. Okay, I've got it. Redwood number four, Redwood number four, and 1179 at Bayshore and Harbor Boulevard. 1179 at Bayshore and Harbor Boulevard. And 1179 is the police code for collisions involving fatalities. As accidents piled up, Bayshore got a new name. Bloody Bayshore, they called it. Two lanes for that peak rush hour traffic. 50,000 drivers, all trying to get out of San Francisco at the same time. And after the nerve-wracking delay, when you get past the real jams, what's a man to do? but open up. Make up for lost time. Beat the speed limit. Just a little. Palo Alto number three. Palo Alto number three. In 1179 on Bayshore and Embarcadero. Palo Alto number three. Palo Alto number three. In 1179. 11 Somebody's number. Some people, besides the police, kept a record of those 1179s, like the managing editor of the Palo Alto Times, Gene Paulson. You know, we've been trying to do the job a newspaper should do to keep the community alert. We've written editorials, we've headlined the accidents, we've published photographs. Here, take a look at some of these. These were run over about a 60-day period. Here's an editorial by editor Eleanor Cogswell, who's been writing them every couple of weeks. Read these Bayshore statistics and shudder. Father and son killed in Bayshore crash. Three others injured. Every time you're out with the children and are half an hour late, I start thinking of ambulances and accidents. Somebody's just got to do something The couple about talked it. it over, decided to do something about it. And Dr. Rochelle, a university professor, wrote an open letter to the governor, sent it to the paper. Dear Mr. Governor, 
We have been rudely impressed by the traffic conditions on Bayshore Highway. Our acquaintances freely refer to it as Suicide Lane and Murder Row. That open letter to the governor was what Paulson had been looking for. He reprinted it the next day on the front page of the Palo Alto Times. There appears to be no indignation about a condition which endangers the lives of all of us. Having just returned from a trip to both Chicago and New York, I have thought to compare the driving in those communities with ours. Nowhere did I see such reckless driving as one can see on Bayshore. Governor, I do not know what I shall do when my children, now too young to drive, will venture forth upon the California highways. People got the idea. The ball got rolling. Three hours after the paper hit the stands, the time switchboard was swamped with calls. Hundreds of letters poured in. The Palo Alto Chamber of Commerce called an emergency meeting. Editor Cogswell kept punching away with the editorials. The Times was keeping the pot boiling. Almost overnight, Highway Commissioner Peterson had five additional patrol cars out on Bayshore. And for each patrolman put on, there was one death less a month. Reduced speed limits were posted at hazardous points. Traffic lights were installed at dangerous intersections. Minor access roads were closed. No left turn signs were placed at intersections with records of left turn accidents. And the headlines continued without let up. In 60 days, deaths and injuries had dropped from 67 to 38 and accidents from 110 to 65. The campaign kept gathering momentum, and the Palo Alto Chamber of Commerce started a drive to sign petitions for extending the Bayshore Freeway. The people got the idea that in addition to better traffic control, they needed to solve the basic problem, a badly overloaded highway. Radio and TV stations in San Francisco itself took up the campaign. Petitions were circulated. At the hospital, Times reporter Francis Moffat, on the left there, tried to get the signatures of four people injured in an auto crash. The entire hospital staff signed up. A petition to extend the six-lane freeway. Sign here, please. And they did. 30,000 of them. In the big towns and the small ones. In Sunnyvale, San Carlos, Mountain View, Los Altos, Belmont, all signed and sealed and ready to be delivered. Two weeks later, a delegation of citizens presented the petitions to Governor Warren. This public support was what the state officials needed. Within 30 days, the legislature acted. Here it is, the new Bayshore Freeway, a highway of modern design, six lanes instead of four. One stretch of the American road made safer because the community took constructive action. What you have just seen was accomplished in 1952, but the job was not finished. It still goes on. As a matter of fact, what happened here in Palo Alto stimulated many California communities to similar efforts. And today, California has a state highway program that is one of the most advanced in the nation. Elsewhere, there are highway problems of another kind that have to be solved, like traffic congestion, for example. Ever been downtown in that six o'clock bumper to bumper madness called a traffic jam? It's worse in our older cities. And so, for our report on how one big city is successfully solving it, let's go east across the country to Pittsburgh, where the Monongahela and the Allegheny River join. That's where Pittsburgh was born 200 years ago. You're looking at what Pittsburghers call the point, the area where the rivers joined to form a triangle, the Golden Triangle, they called it, squeezed between two rivers. Squeeze is the word, all right. This typifies downtown Pittsburgh as it was 10 years ago. A maze of streets, no wider than when the city was a frontier town. Traffic experts and police could arrange and rearrange the traffic pattern. But all 
all they were actually doing was rearranging a nightmare. Pittsburghers knew that the traffic problem couldn't be solved without at the same time rebuilding the very heart of the city. The Allegheny Conference on Community Development went to work on the problem in 1943. Its roster had names from every section of Pittsburgh life. The Mellon Interests, the Steel Industry and the Unions, H.J. Hines and Company, department stores and the governments of the city as well as of the surrounding towns. The average Pittsburgher was tempted to think, well, here we go again. But he began to be impressed by 1945. That was the year when the city realized there was a force behind the paperwork and the plans. You can't use halfway measures. A big problem needs a big answer. You tear down the old and put in the new with modern muscles, modern tools. But the big prime mover that got things going in Pittsburgh, bigger and more powerful than the crane, the acetylene torch, and the bulldozer, was people, the members of the Allegheny Conference. They had to overcome the old, ingrown attitudes of resignation, of doubt that so gigantic a change could actually be accomplished. And they did, and proved it could pay. If you know Pittsburgh, you'll recognize this. It's the old downtown Point District. Dead and gone now, and no one to mourn for it. And this is the plan for the new, now coming to life. There's a new horizon now looking toward the Allegheny. A new landscape, new towers, a new horizon. And for the increased thousands who work downtown, there are municipal underground parking garages going down six stories. You park your car yourself and pick it up yourself going home. And you go home going out of town along the new expressway. That's part of the same master plan for Pittsburgh. You can drive smoothly and safely in and out of the city now. And so you can say that the American road, as it goes through Pittsburgh, is being opened up is being made free. In Palo Alto, you saw how public support could help solve the problem of a dangerous and overloaded highway. In Pittsburgh, it was downtown traffic congestion that was strangling a great metropolitan area. Now let's look at what community action did for Boston. Boston is the hub of a very complex highway system. In New England, all roads lead to Boston. And Boston has kept growing, swelling the towns around it. Today, its metropolitan area extends over 42 cities and towns, with a population of two and one-half million. Once, country roads served the outlying communities adequately. But overnight, they became city streets, with through traffic hopelessly entangled, as you see it here. It became so bad that a trip of 15 miles, say, from Stoneham, north of Boston, to Newton on the south side actually took over an hour. At the State House, there was a highway on paper which could have alleviated all that traffic congestion. Lack of public support had kept it in the files until the people of Essex County, through their Board of Trade, got it out into the light of day. Here you see it on the map, Highway 128. Starting from Gloucester, the old fishing port, it swings in a wide 80-mile arc around the rim of Greater Boston all the way down to Dedham, with its last section now nearing completion. Today, John Smith of Gloucester can leave his family in the morning and travel safely and quickly over a modern express highway to his job. Because new roads, like magic arteries, pump increased values into adjacent land, he now travels past property whose value has increased a hundred times over. Along this highway have sprouted seven great industrial centers, occupied by some of the country's leading manufacturers, and other centers are now being developed. New wealth and new revenues have come to the old New England towns along the highway. And not to forget our Mr. Smith, and thousands more like him, here he is, arriving at his place of work without once having had to fight the Boston traffic. When the people of Essex County pushed for the construction of 128 in order to relieve traffic congestion, 
They didn't know they were going to ring Boston with a golden semicircle. And that's what Highway 128 is called today, Boston's Golden Semicircle. So far, you've seen what improved highways and traffic control mean to a metropolitan area. But all good roads are part of one great pattern, the interstate system that serves the whole nation. The great primary roads that connect the cities, and then the roads that feed into this system. We need good secondary roads to serve the rural population and small towns of America. For that story, we go to North Carolina. Why North Carolina? Well, only a few years ago, the rural population lived largely in the back country, far from the few main highways, in what was called dirt road isolation. But then the people of North Carolina decided on a bold rural roads program. Let's see how this investment is paying off. You're now in a typical farm home in North Carolina. It's morning, and the family's day has begun. Father and son are on their way, one to the farmer's market, the other to his factory job. Daughter has a few seconds longer. Everybody's on the move now. Once, life was lived pretty much around the farm. But now, 21,000 miles of good secondary roads connect the farm to a wider world. The old dirt road isolation is ended. North Carolina's children no longer trudge to the old one-room country schoolhouse. Nearly everybody in the state lives close to good new highways like this one. And good highways mean a good school transportation system. Good roads mean that children from scattered farms can be picked up at all outlying points. Every morning they're on their way to modern schools. The new roads mean that the farmer's son can travel as far as 50 miles to his job at the new factory. And the factory itself could not have been built here if it weren't for the new roads. The rural family can now work in industry as well as on the land. At one time, remote from the big town, the farmer now drives directly to the city market over good roads, a saving in time and effort making possible new and diversified crops that can be delivered quickly. A big factor in the rapid growth of North Carolina. One of the dramatic changes in rural life is in the schools. The old one-room schoolhouse has been replaced by the big central school. Fifteen years ago, these youngsters living 20 miles apart would never have known one another nor would they have had the specialized equipment and training in one of the finest rural school systems in the country. For the farm housewife, the highway leads now to the modern shopping center. To the variety of goods and services she never had before. Farm life has been transformed by the road. The horizon is constantly widened. The rural family looks beyond the nearby crossroads for its social life and amusement. The good road leads to things people couldn't think of years ago. It connects the life of the farm with the life of the town with the varied activities of people everywhere. This is the payoff on the investment in good roads in North Carolina. A fuller life for country people. But North Carolina isn't stopping with its program of secondary roads. Its people have already decided to embark on a new program to improve their system of primary highways. The first big investment has paid off, and North Carolina will invest again, confident of a return. But good roads alone are not always enough. We need proper traffic regulations to promote efficient travel. And we need one more thing, too. We're talking of safe driving. Cars and roads have improved. But the driver must improve, too. Almost as great a challenge to communities as the road itself. Just how can communities go about a safety program? 
To find out, we sent our camera crews to a middle-sized American city in the Middle West, to St. Joseph, Missouri. Population, 79,000. The chief industries are meat packing and grain processing. Other products are work clothing, locomotive parts, wire rope, and safety. Yes, they work on safety here, and they sell it hard in St. Joe. It's a town that hates accidents, maybe because they used to have 2,000 a year. They don't let you forget safety in St. Joe. Safety is everybody's business. It is one business where we can't say, let George do it. Daylight hours are growing shorter day by day, and the danger to pedestrians is increasing. Drivers cannot see you as well in the early morning hours or in the dusk of evening, so cross streets with extra care. They don't let you forget safety in St. Joe. They run it like a million dollar advertising campaign, but there's no million dollars behind it. Only the voluntary activity of lots of people, like the members of this safety council. Walter Ladd is its manager. We use the three E's for traffic safety. E for education, E for engineering, E for enforcement. But the big E is education. Education of the public, education of the individual. This takes a lot of pick and shovel work. It takes coordination and organization. We try to bring every organization and all citizens into it. And we work a lot with the children. In St. Joe, they believe in the educational principle of starting them while they're young. Maybe when this generation grows up, safety will be embedded in its consciousness. School children learn about safety at first hand, right in traffic court. I arrested the defendant at approximately 5.40 p.m. for passing through a red light. Your Honor, it's late, and I'm trying to make this last delivery because I know if I don't get this in, I'm jammed up. I know I didn't go through any red light. In fact, I'm positive. After court sessions, the kids get a chance to ask questions. Well, when he comes to court, and he, and he still says he is not guilty, what happens? Then it is up to the court to decide by the testimony offered by the defendant and by the police officer as to whether or not he is guilty. That is the burden of the court. They teach driving as a regular part of the high school curriculum. In more ways than one, teenagers have to learn about themselves. That includes a knowledge of the machine they will drive and of the normal limitations of human judgment when driving. You've got to learn to put on your brakes a second sooner, not a second later. And I'm sure a lot of good will come from our discussing these various problems. And now I believe we have a few more reports. To sum up the discussion in my section... You're now looking at the annual Teenager Safety Conference. Delegates from all of the high schools participate. The next report, please. We know that there are not enough traffic officers to enforce the laws. Our committee... This is how the adult sense of responsibility develops. This is where community attitude is born. In St. Joe, safety isn't a one-time broadside. Not something for Tuesday to be forgotten Wednesday. It includes campaigning against that tried and true adventurer, the jaywalker. The busy Women's Day in St. Joe includes safety both in committee meetings and in working up programs, like this one. They help police and car dealers organize this car checkup, and they saw it all the way through. Enforcement of sensible traffic regulations has the support of the people, and there are fewer accidents and fewer traffic violations in St. Joe. The prospect is for still less next year. A few years ago, St. Joseph had an average of 17 traffic deaths a year. 
The last five years, the average has been less than five, and last year we had one. How did we do this? It was done by awareness of the public in this problem and by an effective program led by the Safety Council, a full-time organization. The price of such a program is cheap compared with the price of accidents. In St. Joseph, they have learned a lesson that, as with liberty, the price of safety is continual vigilance. You have seen how, in various ways, people in their own communities are getting together to do something about our highway situation. Freedom to travel safely and quickly and comfortably on our highways is not a little freedom, but a big one. As you must realize, every time you get caught in a traffic jam or read the accident figures, in many states, in many cities beside those you have just seen, people are finding real answers to traffic problems. Their stories have been collected in this book, Freedom of the American Road, published by the Ford Motor Company. It is available in your community. This book gives you many workable ideas and tells you where to get expert advice if your community needs help. We hope it may show how you too can help secure for all of us the freedom of the American road. <laughs>